Hi everyone and welcome back. Previously we began the journey of the RTS timeline or what are known today as the classics that pioneered the RTS genre. This video is available on the channel and I highly recommend watching it first prior to seeing this one. I really want to express my absolute appreciation and gratitude from all the support coming from you, whether it be from the comments and likes or just simply watching. It was quite the shock in a positive manner. I love you, Sarge. Today we are going to continue the RTS timeline and head into the golden age of the RTS. The classics did bring us many new features to enhance and ease our gameplay for the RTS, but we can agree that there was still a need to improve overall gameplay. Classic RTS has handled the basics such as resource gathering, unit and building construction, faction unique units, and a mouse cursor to issue commands. And just like the need for humans to advance in technology, this new and exciting video game genre had a lot more to offer in the RTS Golden Age. Two years after the release of Command & Conquer came a new RTS that would imprint some new features to the RTS arsenal. And to the surprise of most, it was not developed by either of the two RTS big names. Total Annihilation, developed by newly founded Cave Dog Entertainment as its introductory game, was released in 1997. This RTS was set in many planets of the Milky Way galaxy thousands of years after modern day society, where two factions, the rebelling humans named the Arm, and the government operating AI machines known as the Core, battle in intergalactic wars. Total Annihilation did confine to the RTS basic rubric, but presented many new significant features. The two main resources of the game are metal and energy, and both can be infinitely extracted at a constant rate per second which was unknown to the RTS genre prior. Part of the RTS strategy of success was to efficiently use the finite resources found throughout the map. Usually the first to run out of resources in a long match had minimal chance of winning. Metal can be extracted from metal deposits throughout the terrain of the map, usually in patches, but it can expand to the entirety of the map if the match is played on a metal planet. Metal makers do not require to be built on metal deposits and in turn use energy to produce metal. They are generally efficient at making metal at a low cost of energy. Energy can be extracted via many methods such as solar collectors and wind generators which can be built anywhere on the land terrain. The wind generators production levels are positively correlated to the wind speed of the map. Another new feature that has been introduced in Total Annihilation is the physics engine which takes the height of the terrain into consideration. When units fire projectiles towards an enemy unit that is on an elevated terrain, they are likely going to miss or have their projectiles blocked by the terrain itself. The in-game visuals were a slight improvement from Command & Conquer and Warcraft, but the one visual aspect that differentiated this game among the past RTS was the introduction of 3D graphics in the RTS world. Two simple but new and important features are the multitask command, which no longer has the need for you to wait until the unit completes a task in order for you to recommand them to a new one. By holding down the shift key on a selected unit, you are able to see what tasks are queued and you can add in more. Second is the unit production queues which prevents you from constantly having to click to recruit. Both will keep you focused on other tasks. The pathfinding is much improved to that of Warcraft and Command and & Conquer, but it does not feel as if this is the case, since the unit movements are much slower. The dispatch units will eventually reach far out locations, but it will take some time. Another positive is that while being dispatched and moving, they will attack enemy units they encounter on their way. Although you can't click the attack command to an area, it is not needed because wherever you move your units to, they will attack the enemies on the way. Attack sequences and the gameplay in general are much slower paced because as mentioned earlier, the slower unit movement, projectiles frequently missing their targets, and an increased unit population. There are vast types of units each recruited in their own facility. Bots, vehicles, aircrafts, ships, and even hovercrafts, which is why there are many more units present on the map. There are 61 buildings and 36 unique units in each faction that have similar roles but have a completely different visual model. Double Warcraft 2 and Command and & Conquer combine. The AI has really improved. They will target your resource extracting buildings to potentially stun any building or unit production. They also have knowledge of when to retreat and regroup. Almost every campaign and skirmish you begin with a special unit, similar to the Warcraft 2 heroes called the Commander. He has the ability to construct, attack, capture units and buildings, reclaim resources from trees and fallen buildings and units, and uses a special ability called the D-Gun. The D-Gun instant kills enemy units and buildings over a line. While it is very practical, it does cost a considerable amount of energy, and it can destroy your units present within the line of attack. But you must be cautious in utilizing the commander for combat, because if he is slain, the battle is concluded and you are defeated. 
Total Annihilation went on to add two expansions, the core contingency and battle tactics, which added many new units and missions and continued the story after the core's defeat. The RTS did have some success financially as it sold 1.5 million copies by 2002, but it was its critical reception that shows you how much of an influence this RTS became to the genre. It won four awards on GameSpot in 1997, best music, best multiplayer, best strategy game, and even best overall game. It was very unfortunate at the time of Total Annihilation's release that another RTS was released two weeks after. I only found out about its existence three years after its arrival to the video game world through word from friends that I should give it a try. And I really wish I had given it more of a chance, because it is an amazing RTS with lots of content and innovation. The game has never had a remaster other than a resolution change and is still very enjoyable and playable today. Interestingly enough, Total Annihilation did not receive nearly as much financial success and respect that it should have because of not being developed or published by a big name such as Blizzard or Westward, or even the publisher of the next game in our timeline. Age of Empires was developed by Ensemble Studios and published by a big name called Microsoft. As an infant, I can recall exactly when Age of Empires released, and it was due to the in-store marketing, magazines, and especially the commercials. Age of Empires. It is an RTS set in the ancient times of before Common Era, and it has single-player campaigns from five major civilizations during that time. Egypt, Greece, Babylon, Yamato, and Rome for the expansion, each of them having multiple scenarios to overcome. The gameplay is not entirely historically accurate, but since it's slightly relatable, it seems to have attracted a new audience in the RTS world, which it used to be either fantasy or sci-fi fans. In the beginning of the scenario, you usually have a town center and a few villagers ready for you to command to help you harvest, recruit more units, and advance in the many ages present, starting from the stone, to tool, to bronze, and finally the Iron Age. The campaign scenario will dictate what is the furthest age you can progress and what units and buildings are available. Similarly, it will have different conditions to achieve victory. Build your base and destroy the enemy base. Fix the amount of units with the hero having to survive. Capture all artifacts or ruins. Construct and maintain a special building called a wonder for a certain amount of in-game years. There are four resources to collect, food and wood being the two main abundant resources and stone and gold are usually harder to find, but all of which are finite. Food can be gathered through many methods such as hunting, foraging, fishing, and farming. The in-game visuals feel very realistic and movement feels very smooth, and this is because the graphics were pre-rendered from a 3D model. Overall, the pathfinding is horrendous and inefficient even for its time. The units usually get stuck in front of trees or water when dispatched to farther locations, and they do not choose the optimal path. With these shortcomings and adding slow unit movement, you are left with frequently clicking shorter waypoints. This takes away your focus from the other macro management tasks. An attack area is not present and you have to repeatedly click enemy units or buildings to issue an attack, or else they'll remain idle near enemy buildings. Unit queuing was not present until the expansion, which eased up on some of the manual tasks. The multitask command we saw introduced in Total Annihilation is present, although not nearly as effective, because once you issue out the multi commands, you are not able to go back to the unit and see what commands are still in queue. And when you want to command additional structures to be built for a villager that is already building, he will stop constructing the building he is working on and start on the one you just commanded him to do, rather than just adding the task at the bottom of his queues. He will eventually finish building the unconstructed buildings in the surrounded area though. One major flaw I found in this game that thankfully they removed, only in the multiplayer in the expansion, was the population limit of 50. The fact that map sizes were large and the major resources food and wood production were almost unlimited to the vast trees, the 50 unit limit just did not make sense. Especially if you decided to have a large peasant population in the beginning of the match to quickly develop your base. There are 16 civilizations, also known as factions, grouped in 5 different architectural styles, East Asian, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greek, and Roman. The total number of units and their upgraded forms is 45, but each civilization is limited to certain unit builds and research, and there are no civilization unique units, which is somewhat disappointing in that most of the RTSs we've covered so far at least have a few unique units, either their visuals, stats, or special moves. Age of Empires includes a scenario builder where you can create and edit map terrains change victory and defeat conditions, and change other parameters such as starting resources. One setback is the editor does not allow you to edit the statistics of your units like that of Warcraft 2's. It also includes a random map generator where you can have maps created quickly for your taste of gameplay.
Multiplayer was present and had capability of running a match that can hold up to 8 players through Microsoft Gaming Zone. It would lag a lot and would disconnect often and would not compare to Blizzard's Battle.net. Eventually Microsoft Gaming Zone would cease to exist by 2006. Age of Empires was a success financially and critically. It sold over 2.2 million copies and 1.2 coming from the expansion Rise of Rome. It won Game of the Year in 1997, GameCenter.com. Although it mostly had positive reviews, it does have its fair share of criticism for many of its imperfections mentioned earlier. A lot of this was brushed off by the consumer because I believe the game was just memorable like Warcraft, which it's often compared to, and its music which was created using the instruments of that time. the unique and well-acted sound effects. The relatable story we get as a history lesson from classes at school or from family. Age of Empires was just the beginning of a prominent series for the RTS genre for years to come and is still standing strong. And speaking of a prominent series, the next RTS we'll be discussing has also done that. Three years after Warcraft 2's release, StarCraft, created by familiar developer big name Blizzard Entertainment, has entered itself back into the mix of the RTS world once again. But with this new series that takes place thousands of years after modern day, Turan are the exiled humans sent the fictional Caprulu sector of the Milky Way galaxy to colonize its planets. But struggles within their own people and government, along with the discovery of two new alien races, the Zerg and the Protoss, who both seek the Turans and each other's destructions, causes all-out wars. The faction differences in StarCraft are completely unique from one another. You will not be able to match their units, structures, tech, and something newly introduced characteristics side by side. Let's analyze some of their different characteristics, beginning by the method of building. For the Protoss, the worker unit only begins the building process and is not needed to progress it after that. Out of the three, this is the most efficient building process as one worker unit can quickly have multiple structures up and running. Though one setback is that the Protoss buildings must only be warped on areas of the power grid formed by the pylons, which also act as the supply population building. Another setback is the lack of repairing, regeneration, or healing ability of buildings or units for the Protoss. But the shields that act identically to hit points can be regenerated slowly or recharge via the shield battery, though the shield battery cannot recharge shields for the buildings. The Zerg are probably the least efficient when building in my opinion, in that the unit worker transforms into the desired structure, so on top of losing the worker unit, you have to recruit a new one every time to build again. And that's not all their building limitations. The Zerg may only build on creep, the biomass that spreads on the ground when certain buildings are built. The structures and units may not be repaired or healed, but they will regenerate health over time. One beneficial characteristic found in the Zerg species is the centralized recruitment of the hatchery, and the fact that up to three units can be spawned at the same time from larvae. This can easily allow for quick recruitment and early attack rushes in a match. The Turan, when it comes to building, must have the SCV remain present the whole time of the building process. Although the Turan do not have any restrictions and can build essentially anywhere on uncovered ground terrain, buildings and mechanical units can be repaired by the SCV, and organic units can be healed by the medic. Now let's do an overview of each of the factions. They have about 14 different units. Units within the faction have unique methods of aiding you in the battle by either scouting, heavy splash damage, stealth, and so forth. But each faction has its own method of dominance. For example, the Protoss rely on expensive, slower, and stronger units, while the Zerg, who find themselves on the other side of the quality versus the quantity spectrum, have low cost and quicker but weaker units. And both have contrasting recruitment times as analyzed earlier. And so where do the Turan fit in all of this? Right in the middle. They have the versatility to satisfy a player that enjoys any type of attack strategy. And they are generally preferred for new players. And one interesting thing to note is that all three races are balanced and not one race has the advantage over the other. For instance, it is known that the Bloodlust overpowered ability in Warcraft 2 gives the Orc a clear advantage over the humans. In the single player campaigns there are three different episodes for each race and they must be played in a certain order to fully enjoy the intention siphoning story. I won't get into too much detail about the story as it has its complexities and it's probably best if you seek it out first hand from the game. Before every mission there is a briefing that involves a video conference amongst yourself in first person and other key members who will play a role on the mission, whether in the actual gameplay or in the background. Full dialogue was present and it really gave you a better understanding of each character's personality, rather than have a narrator simply read out your tasks and the plot. I'm pretty much the queen bitch of the universe. To go over some of the gameplay, we can see that unit queues are present, but up to 5 units only per building, easing up the attention needed to click to recruit every time. Recruited units can be rallied to a certain area on the map, eliminating the task of grouping and moving units to defend an attack front. 
The pathfinding in StarCraft is still a work in progress for the RTS picture, but much improved to that of Age of Empires. The units do not get stuck in front of obstacles on long dispatches, but they will sometimes not take the optimal and safest route. For example, they will traverse through the enemy base rather than taking the path without enemies. And when there is crowding, especially close to a ramp, the larger units seem to have a hard time maneuvering around the other units and end up searching for another route of entry. And the major highlight of this game is its compatibility with the multiplayer platform Blizzard introduced a year before StarCraft's release, Battle.net. Being able to play at no cost with up to 8 players on different victory conditions such as Domination, King of the Hill, and Capture the Flag, all while socializing, just felt new and intriguing to a growing video game genre. A ranking system for StarCraft was created for competitive play across the globe, which played a factor in increasing the amount of Battle.net users by 800% as of 1999. It was a global, cultural phenomenon for its time, and presently you can still find a strong fan base that participate in tournaments or simply indulge as spectators. StarCraft was a major success both financially selling 11 million units as of 2009, the most sales for an RTS, and critically as it won numerous awards. But really, if we recall what StarCraft has brought to the RTS name, there really is not a whole lot of innovation that Total Annihilation and previous RTS did not already have. But this is what made StarCraft successful. Its simplicity in sticking to the RTS standard formula while adding few new changes maintained the RTS community's trust. So far, we have gone through three games each having developed by a different name and all have deeply contributed to the RTS timeline. But this RTS I'm about to go over with you is a sequel to a previous one mentioned that put out a name for the series and had some success, but certainly it required a lot of gameplay improvement. The second installment of Age of Empires called The Age of Kings was revealed to the gaming world two years after the release of the first. The story of Age of Empires is continued and now heads into the Middle Ages and eventually into the Age of Exploration when including the later released expansions. The story is still catching the attention of gamers for being highly relatable, intriguing, and quite exaggerated, and often can bring up the question, so this is how humanity settles its differences back then. English found out guilty and burnt her at the stake. Age of Empires 2 was actually developed using the same engine as Age of Empires 1, but don't let that paint a picture in your mind that the many issues were carried over. In fact, most gameplay issues seem to have been solved or at least improved. Thankfully, the population limit has been increased to 200, four times to what it was in Age of Empires 1, and it only makes sense given that the resources are practically unlimited with the vast forests and the building of farms, and also through the newly introduced resource purchasing and selling at the market. Gold can now be collected with no limit through trade carts that travel to chosen marketplaces, usually allied ones but it also can be the enemies. When you locate a relic and bring it to the monastery, you slowly earn gold by the second, and it will not cease unless the relic is no longer in the monastery's possession. Unit queuing and rally points have been added to the sequel. A nice new feature is the ability to have automatic military formations, which can be used to protect weaker units, flank an enemy, or spread them out to avoid splash damage from siege units. An attack area is present, although you must click the tab button since there's no attack command. I feel though the units will prioritize getting to the spot you flag before attacking any enemy units or buildings that they encounter in their path. Two new ingredients that added to the genre introduced in this game was the idle villager button that moved to the screen to a taskless villager, which always was a problem realizing this whole time you're focused on a different part of the map, there were workers that just stood there. The other addition which helped your defenseless worker units was the bell button in the town center. When clicked, the villagers would stop working and head to garrison in this town center, which in turn would launch arrows at the attackers. The ability to garrison infantry units within these three buildings, towers, town centers and castles, allows for more arrows to be fired and thus increasing the total damage and it's great for base defensive measures. This is nothing new to the RTS picture as StarCraft had bunkers that allowed your infantry to attack and take cover in also, but it was not nearly as prominent to the extent of Age of Empires 2, where there was a higher capacity to garrison units and more type of buildings available to all factions. The music was diverse in that it also used instruments from cultures around the world, similarly to Age of Empires 1. and the main theme engraved into your conscience, the feeling of beginning a new journey of conquest. The sound effects are familiar as most of them were carried over from the preceding game, but one small detail that had fans appreciate the game even more was that the in-game unit acknowledgements used or at least attempted to use actual modern languages that relate to past civilizations. There are three human military classes, infantry, ranged, and cavalry. 
They follow a triangular formula that decides the strength and weaknesses amongst them. There is an exception to this rule, as some units' main purpose is to counter the other unit types that normally their class is weak against. A main example are the pike units, which do extra damage to cavalry. As you traverse into the ages by meeting the building and resource requirements, you will come across a building that is named after one of the ages, a castle. There you can recruit specialized unique units to each civilization that usually have special powers or higher statistics in comparison to the generic units. These specialized units benefit from both the technology of their military type and their own exclusive ones. To show you an example, the long bowmen for the English civilization have ridiculous attack range when maxed out in available technology. Despite the fact that Age of Empires 2 has only one or two units that are dubbed specialized and unique to each of the 13 original civilization, there is also a unique tech team bonus which is shared with all of your allies and many other perks. Team bonuses can be effective in multiplayer where you can choose civilizations that both specialize in a certain area to bolster their advantages. The Franks have a 20% increase in knight HP that would further benefit from the Persians team bonus of plus two knight attack against archers, making the knights even more lethal. The content present in Age of Empires 2 is so vast that replay value is immeasurable with updates that are ongoing until today. An HD version was released in 2013 and a definitive version in 2019 along with expansions, which keeps the general gameplay but adds new features such as civilizations, units, and campaigns. In other words, you will never feel bored playing Age of Empires 2. Age of Empires 2 has sold 11 million copies when including all remasters of the game, making the top 3 RTS of most units sold behind previously mentioned StarCraft. It has won numerous strategy game awards, most notably GameSpot Strategy of the Year in 1999. The improvement from Age of Empires 1 felt drastic, even though they both use the same game engine. And rather than focus entirely on innovation and modernization, it basically took the old game and corrected all the issues that the consumers could not bear. Age of Empires 1 was born so that Age of Empires 2 can thrive. And nothing is more encouraging as a consumer than having the developers listen to the community. The next RTS is from a familiar series that seems to have taken a bit of a hiatus, but has come back with quite a hit. Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos was released in 2002, seven years after Warcraft 2, and continues the story following the events of the Beyond the Dark Portal expansion. It begins with a young Prince Arthas and his childhood friend Jaina, who are set out to investigate a growing plague that turns the living into the undead. Arthas soon grows impatient seeing his people quickly transform to the undead, and wishes to take the battle to them. Little does he know that this obsession of seeking vengeance turns him mad. He loses companionship with his mentor, Uther Lightbringer, and Jaina, for choosing extreme measures such as killing his own people. Eventually he claims the cursed sword, Frostmourne, and joins what he was striving to stop, the undead. I remember just watching the story unfold, and I was mesmerized that this was happening. And it did not end there. He murdered both the king, his father... What are you doing, my son? Succeeding you, father. Oh! And Uther. He ordered the destruction of his own kingdom, Lordron, the massacre of the elf homeland of Quel'Thalas, and the eradication of Deleron. It was unbelievable how this all ensued in just one campaign. One of my favorite stories made by an RTS game. The amazing character development of Arthas from going to the Golden Boy and Future of Lordaeron to a soulless obsessed Death Knight just had me glued to the game until I completed it. Normally I don't get into depth with the story of the RTS, but this one felt the most compelling I have played so far. It is there that your people's salvation will be assured. Let's get into some of the new gameplay features that have been introduced. There are four factions, the Human Alliance and Orc Horde still being present, and the other two new factions are the Undead and the Night Elves. The one thing I've noticed is that each faction does not have a generalized style of play. We don't see the quality versus quantity spectrum present in StarCraft. All factions do have unique units, but really can cater to any type of attack. They have their heavy, light, and spellcasting units. Despite this, all races seem to be quite balanced with no advantages favoring one. Let's go over each of the faction characteristics, starting off with the Night Elves. The construction method is similar to that of the Zerg, where the Wisp will inefficiently transform into any of the ancient buildings. But the benefit of these buildings is that they are able to slowly move and attack if needed, which has been introduced in Warcraft 3 as the faction unique base defense. They are also able to heal through tree consumption, on top of being able to be repaired, which is available to all races. Fortunately, when the Wisp construct Moon Wells, for instance, they will not transform. The Tree of Life must entangle the gold mine to be able to have up to 5 wisps harvest gold. To harvest lumber, the wisps attach themselves to the trees and collect by the second. What is neat is that the trees do not get cut down. For both resources, the wisps do not need to return to the base with harvested goods to accumulate your total. 
The other new faction, the Undead, constructs similar to the Protoss, where the Accolade initiates the building process and is not needed after that. But they must build within blighted areas, same idea as the Zerg Creep, where certain buildings can only expand the blight. Their unique base defense is that the Hall of Dead will shoot a ray beam at approaching enemies. Gold is harvested by having an Accolade haunt the gold mine and up to 5 Accolades can help harvest without needing to constantly return to base. For lumber, it is actually the Ghouls, a first level melee unit, to chop the trees. The Orc use supply buildings to garrison peons to fire arrows at invading enemies. This garrisoning can be activated when you click the battle stations command. Research found in the war mill can allow your buildings to be equipped with spikes which will damage any enemies that closely approach it. The orc building process is not quite efficient either in that the peon must be present for the whole duration and other peons cannot help with hastening the build. Both the orc and human races follow the usual gathering of resources for lumber and gold. They will harvest a certain amount and return to the base or mill. The humans are able to have more than one peasant help with the building process, speeding it up significantly, but it will cost you additional resources. Their unique base defense consists of peasants temporarily transforming into militia when initiated by you. They will gain armor and increase attack to help fend off invaders. Warcraft 3 has introduced a magnitude of new RTS features, some that are as simple as tech queuing to save you from having to go to the buildings and research one at a time. This is extremely important for Warcraft 3 as there are up to 40 different research techs per faction. That's almost triple Starcraft. Autocast lets you make your units automatically cast certain spells or abilities. For example, a necromancer with raised dead set to autocast will automatically animate skeletons whenever there are corpses nearby. Without autocast enabled, the player has to click on the spell and select a target. Autocast saves the player time, clicks, and keystrokes, and lets them focus on other actions. However, only certain spells can have autocast enabled. The food supply limit is 100, which is reasonable, but you also have to keep in mind of the different levels of upkeeps, which has added a new difficulty in Warcraft 3. 0 to 50 food usage has no upkeep, 100% of the gold is kept when harvested, low upkeep is active when 50 to 80 food supply is used, and 70% of gold is kept, and the one you should try to avoid is high upkeep, from 81 to 100, where you only keep 40%. One suggestion is to make sure to launch attacks when low and high upkeeps are active, so that any lost units will help bring the upkeep down. An RTS feature that is not new at all but that has without doubt been expanded on in Warcraft 3 are the many damage and armor types that depending on what they get matched up with can either increase or decrease the damage or not be affected at all. For example, piercing does extra damage to light and unarmored units but does reduce damage to medium, fortified and hero and it does full damage to heavy armored units. Adding this feature allows you to be able to decide what type of units to bring for an attack. For example, if you are raiding a base, you should bring units that inflict siege damage to obtain damage bonuses on buildings that have fortified armor. The heroes in Warcraft 3 are actually very useful and can be used with your attacks without worrying about having to keep them alive to prevent failing a mission, because they can be revived at the altar. An RPG aspect was added that allowed your hero to gain experience through kills and once they gain enough experience, they leveled up. Their stats would increase and they would be able to pick from a few spells to learn. When they reach level 6, they will be able to learn a strong, unique spell. The heroes also carried a 6 item inventory that could be used to store one time use items such as potions, scrolls for example, and artifacts which were permanent stat boosters so long as they were kept in the inventory. The hero can purchase items from the shops located across the maps. Any valid unit or hero can hire mercenaries at the mercenary camps, but both these buildings are guarded by creeps, the neutral units of the map that can be defeated for gold and treasures. They will attack when approached. The technical aspects of gameplay has improved. The pathfinding in my opinion is tied with Age of Empires 2 for top tier so far. Having your units stuck on long range dispatches is non-existent anymore, and the paths that are taken are almost always optimal. Units can easily maneuver around each other and the attack area is effective and units will attack any enemies within the vicinity of their site. The visuals of the game were cartoonish and not as detailed because they were in 3D, which was still unusual for RTSs at the time. I really enjoyed the in-game cutscenes, the voice acting and dialogue were just genuine. You can slowly start to hear the instability and obsession develop in Arthas's voice as you progress in the campaign. I'll hunt you to the ends of the earth if I have to. Do you hear me? TO THE ENDS OF THE EARTH! The in-game music was great, but I feel it wasn't quite as upbeat and matching for an RTS. This seems to be a developing theme for Martin RTS I'll touch more on in the next video. 
The multiplayer used a battle net similar to that of StarCraft, but has been improved with random matchmaking to allow you face opponents within your rank. One of the biggest hidden gems of this game was the world editor, allowing you to manipulate pretty much every aspect of the game. Unit statistics, spells, unit sizes, objectives, and even allowed you to create your own cutscenes, scripts, and triggers. A lot of fan-made maps and campaigns have been made and are very enjoyable. One that was very popular was a game called Defense of the Ancients. The team that created this map went on to create their own sequel game called Dota 2 and have had much success with that. Warcraft 3 and its expansion Frozen Throne has sold over 4 million copies to date and is a critical success. Often praised for being a well polished game with an easy to learn interface and a campaign story that will draw your attention for its entirety. A remaster of Warcraft 3 was released in 2020, Warcraft 3 Reforged, and it was not accepted by fans with open arms. A lot of new content and features were not included as promised. I was really hoping for an added campaign, but I honestly did not have any major issues with the remake. It was the same amazing game with better visuals after all. It is really a shame that Blizzard had decided to continue the Warcraft series through World of Warcraft, an MMORPG released in 2004, but it almost seemed that they knew the glory days of the RTS was nearing its end, and the popularity of the MMORPG was on the rise. But Warcraft 3 will be regarded as the RTS that was a transition to the modernization of the genre through gameplay automations, RPG elements, and a user-friendly interface. We have gone through 5 RTS games that are equally memorable to the genre, that exploded to fame during this time from late 90s to early 2000s. The competition in these years was at a high level that for sure I had missed some noteworthy ones, but we can only go through so many, and I picked these 5s because I believe they were the most impactful to the development of the RTS, and each had a theme of success. Total Annihilation was innovative and was the transition between the classics to the golden age, Age of Empires 1 and 2 showed the importance of prioritizing the fixing of in-game issues before creativity. StarCraft preserved the basic RTS formula and expanded in the areas that were already seen in the RTS world before. And to finish off this Golden Age era, Warcraft 3 is best known for the stunning visuals and cutscenes. Get my regards to hell, you son of a bitch. Modernizing the RTS gameplay to add a new RPG element and a campaign story that felt cinematic. You freed us all. Our next video we will be touching on the modern RTS era, where it is often quoted as the twilight years of the RTS. And we will conclude the timeline to answer the important question, what happened to the real time strategy genre? Please do not be shy and let me know what you thought of the second video of the RTS timeline, either with a comment or a like. Was it too long? Did I go into depth a little too much on certain points? What do you want to see more of? If you really did enjoy, please subscribe. I guarantee you it will be an investment worth your time. I really appreciate all the support and I hope to hear from you next time. Thank you and have a wonderful day.